cardiovascular disease is the most common cause of mortality and morbidity worldwide. Well, ischemic heart disease is the most common cause of cardiovascular death and acute coronary syndrome, ACS, is often the first clinical manifestation of ischemic heart disease. In the coming weeks, I'll revise the topic of acute coronary syndrome, ACS, based on the latest European Society of Cardiology guidelines and also based on my humble personal experience. I hope that we can clear the confusion about definitions, ECG, cardiac enzymes, management in the emergency, indications for angiography, hospital management, and long-term management. So buckle up for a deep dive into acute coronary syndromes. Welcome to Cardio Buzz, your one-stop shop for all things cardiology. We bring the latest news and research on heart health. We also provide the practicing doctors with summaries of the latest cardiology guidelines to help improve the knowledge and the practice. Doctors, please let us start with the definitions. I am confused by the terms. What is the difference between unstable angina, acute coronary syndromes, and acute MI? Yes, I will clarify the terms here because definitions are important. Acute coronary syndromes encompass a spectrum of conditions with a common feature that is sudden or recent change in the clinical symptoms of the patient or sudden or recent change in the clinical signs. This can happen with or without changes in the ECG and this can also happen with or without elevation of cardiac biomarkers or troponin. Patients presenting with suspected ACS may eventually receive a diagnosis of unstable angina or acute myocardial infarction. And ACS can present in many forms. Patients can have vague symptoms or minimum symptoms, or they can have ongoing or recurrent chest discomfort. They can present with electrical or hemodynamic instability or cardiogenic shock, or they can even present with cardiac arrest. ECG and troponin are important in the initial triage and diagnosis of patients with ACS, helping to risk stratify patients and to guide the initial manager. Patients are classified based on the ECG at presentation to a working diagnosis of either STEMI or non-ST elevation ACS. After that, patients can be further classified based on the presence or absence of cardiac troponin elevation once the results are available. However, after the acute management and stabilization, most aspects of the subsequent management are common to all patients with ACS, keeping in mind that after the workup, some patients will end up having non-ACS diagnosis. Okay, then what is unstable angina? Unstable angina is a clinical term. It's defined as myocardial ischemia at rest or on minimal exertion in the absence of acute myocyte injury or necrosis. It's usually characterized by specific clinical findings of prolonged chest pain, more than 20 minutes, usually at rest, or new onset of severe angina, or angina that is increasing in frequency, longer in duration, or lower in threshold, or angina that occurs after a recent episode of myocardial infarction. Then what is myocardial infarction? Myocardial infarction involves the same clinical variables like those of unstable angina, but in addition, there must be evidence of myocyte necrosis or injury, the biochemical evidence of troponin elevation or of other cardiac biomarkers in the blood test. And the formal scientific definition of myocardial infarction has changed several times over the last decade. We now have the fourth universal definition of myocardial infarction, which helps differentiate myocardial infarction from myocardial injury and classifies myocardial infarction into five types based on the cause of the infarction and the clinical situation. Based on the latest universal definition of myocardial infarction, we need a combination of criteria to meet the diagnosis. We need an increase or a decrease of cardiac biomarkers, preferably the high sensitivity cardiac troponin T or I, with at least one value above the 99th percentile of the upper reference limit. In addition to that, we need at least one of the following. Symptoms of myocardial ischemia, new ischemic ECG changes, development of pathological Q waves on the ECG, imaging evidence of loss of viral myocardia or new one motion abnormalities, or an intracoronary thrombus that is detected either by angiography or in autopsy. And so, is myocardial infarction one diagnostic clinical entity? We have five types of myocardial infarction. Type 1 MI, that's the most common. It's caused by atherosclerotic plaque rupture, ulceration, or erosion, which results in the formation of a thrombus in one or more of the coronary arteries, leading to decreased myocardial blood flow, distal embolization, and myocardial necrosis. Patients diagnosed with type 1 MI will usually have obstructive coronary disease, usually more than 50% diameter stenosis, but in 5-10% to of cases, there may be non-obstructive coronary atherosclerosis, particularly in women. 
Type 2 MI is a myocardial necrosis in which a condition other than coronary plaque instability causes an imbalance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand. This could be due to hypotension, hypertension, tachyarrhythmia, bradyarrhythmia, anemia, hypoxemia, coronary spasm, spontaneous coronary dissection, coronary microvascular disease. Type 3 MI is the MI that results in cardiac death with symptoms suggestive of MI or MI is detected only at biopsy. Type 4 MI is caused by a percutaneous coronary intervention, angioplasty or stenting. Type 5 MI is the MI that's caused by coronary artery bypass graft. So troponin elevation is essential to diagnose myocardial infarction, but we frequently get called for patients who have non-cardiac or vague medical conditions, and they also have troponin elevation. How should we deal with these patients? Yes, you will be consulted to see patients who had troponin tests out of the clinical context, usually in the emergency department. But the troponin came elevated, and then you need to deal with that situation. Isolated troponin elevations without symptoms of ischemia or new ECG changes is known as myocardial injury. And this is another distinct entity, which is troponin release due to mechanisms other than myocardial ischemia and not meeting the criteria of MI. It could still be a cardiac condition, could be due to heart failure, myocarditis, any cardiomyopathy, Takotsubo syndrome, cardiac contusion, coronary artery bypass graft, PCI, valvular intervention, ablation, cardioversion, or endomyocardial biopsy. But more commonly, it's a non-cardiac condition, sepsis, chronic kidney disease, stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary hypertension. Any critically ill patient can have elevation of troponin. Hypothyroidism can elevate the troponin. Hyperthyroidism can do the same. Rhabdomyolysis, even strenuous exercise, marathon running, can elevate the troponin. Okay, doctor. Now I understood the spectrum of acute coronary syndrome and the difference between myocardial infarction and myocardial injury, although I believe that troponin needs an episode on its own. Now let's be practical. I am seeing a patient now in the emergency or in the clinic who comes complaining of prolonged chest pain or discomfort. What should be the first steps that I will take? There are four foundational measures. Number one, history taking. Number two, physical examination. Number three, 12 lead ECG. And number four, troponin sampling. Let's start by symptoms. Acute chest pain is the leading symptom in acute coronary syndrome. And we classify chest pain as either cardiac possibly cardiac or non-cardiac. The use of the descriptor atypical or typical should be avoided. In addition to chest pain, we have chest pain equivalents like dyspnea, epigastric pain, pain in the left arm, pain in the right arm or the neck or the jaw. Whenever we get a patient with chest pain, we need to determine the onset of the worst pain, previous cardiac history and the risk factor profile. Will the nature of the pain guide us in the emergency setting? Well, not really. Overall, the diagnostic performance of the chest pain characteristics is limited in those patients who present to the emergency department with suspected ACS. We classify the pain as cardiac, possible cardiac, or non-cardiac, but this usually does not have a great diagnostic performance. We need to understand the risk factors like old age, male sex, family history of coronary artery disease, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, smoking, hypertension, renal dysfunction, the presence of peripheral or carotid artery disease, they all increase the likelihood of ACS, regardless of the nature of the pain being cardiac, possible cardiac, or non-cardiac. In addition, we need to take history to diagnose some conditions that may exacerbate or precipitate ACS, like anemia, infection, fever, emotional stress, thyroid disorders, and endocrine disorders. Got it. But are there differences between men and women regarding their symptoms in acute coronary syndromes? Over 80% of men and women with ACS present with chest pain or chest pressure. Other common symptoms like sweating, shoulder pain, arm pain, indigestion, epigastric pain, they are relatively common both in men and in women with ACS. While some of the less common symptoms at presentation may be more common in women with ACS, these differences are minor and do not support the use of women-specific chest pain characteristics for the early diagnosis of MI. Okay regardless of the gender. If the pain gets relieved by nitrates, wouldn't that be a definite proof that the pain is cardiac? 
The relief of symptoms after nitroglycerin administration may increase the likelihood of ACS, but it's not specific for ACS because it has also been reported in gastrointestinal disorders and esophageal spasms. In patients with a working diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome, the administration of nitroglycerin is just an attempt at pain relief, and it's not recommended as a diagnostic test. However, complete normalization of ST segment elevation after nitroglycerin administration, along with a complete relief of symptoms, is suggestive of coronary spasm with or without myocardial infarction. Okay, it seems we need to pay careful attention not just to the nature of the symptoms, but also to the patient as a whole. Now let's move to physical examination. Shouldn't we better rely on echo, x-rays, and lab results rather than our hands, ears, and stethoscopes? No, physical examination is among the most valuable tools in medicine. And if you omit or neglect physical examination, you will miss a lot and the patients will lose a lot. Cardiac auscultation in ACS may reveal a systolic murmur due to ischemic mitral regurgitation, which means a poor prognosis. Alternatively, the murmur of aortic stenosis may be detected, and aortic stenosis can present as ACS. Rarely, the systolic murmur may be due to a mechanical complication, papillary muscle rupture or ventricular septal rupture, especially in late presenters after a myocardial infarction who were not revascularized. If you hear a murmur of aortic insufficiency, then you should consider acute aortic dissection with ACS. Physical examination may also identify signs of non-coronary causes of chest pain, like myopericarditis, extracardiac pathologies like pneumothorax, pneumonia, or musculoskeletal diseases. The presence of chest pain that is reproduced by exerting pressure on the chest wall has some negative predictive value for ACS. Other signs like pallor, sweating, or tremor are often signs of stress related to the MI, but they can point towards precipitating conditions, for example, anemia or thyrotoxicosis. Abdominal examination is important because reflex esophagitis, gastric ulcer, cholecystitis, pancreatitis are among the differential diagnoses of ACS. Differences in blood pressure between the upper and the lower limbs or between the arms are highly suggestive of aortic dissection. Elevated jugular venous pressure and friction rump are suggestive, of course, of acute heart failure or acute pericarditis and myocarditis. It seems we must give more time and respect to physical examination. But honestly, I get scared more when I am confronted by an ECG and furthermore when I am trying to put the ECG in the context of chest pain. The resting 12 lead ECG is the first diagnostic tool in the assessment of patients with suspected ACS. ECG should be obtained immediately upon the first medical contact, should be interpreted by a qualified physician or technician within 10 minutes, and should be repeated as necessary. When you first look at the ECG of someone with acute chest pain, you need to classify them into one of two broad categories that will dictate the rest of the initial management. A segment elevation or no ST segment elevation. Acute chest pain or chest pain equivalent symptoms with persistent ST segment elevation or ST segment elevation equivalence that we will describe shortly would lead us to the working diagnosis of ST elevation myocardial infarction or STEMI. ST segment elevation is an interesting sign because it's one of the most sensitive signs for ongoing inclusion of a major epicardial coronary vessel. ST elevation or ST elevation equivalence should prompt a triage for immediate reperfusion therapy. The vast majority of patients with ST segment elevation or equivalence will sustain myocardial necrosis and troponin elevation, fulfilling the criteria for a myocardial infarction. But keep in mind, that in some patients, myocardial infarction will not be the final diagnosis. You may end up having myocarditis, pericarditis, hyperkalemia, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or other conditions. Then, should we consider any ST segment elevation diagnostic of myocardial infarction? ST segment elevation is measured at the J point. In order for the ST elevation to be diagnostic, we need elevation in at least two contiguous leads. In the precordial lead, in V2 and V3, in women, more than or equal 1.5 millimeters, regardless of the age. Whereas in men younger than 40 years, we need more than or equal 2.5 millimeters of ST segment elevation. In older men, 40 years and more, we need just 2 millimeters or more of ST segment elevation. In other leads, the threshold is more than or equal just 1 millimeter. Of course, in the absence of left ventricular hypertrophy or left bundle branch block. You have just mentioned something about ST segment elevation equivalents. What are these ECG equivalents? ST segment elevation equivalents include ST segment depression in leads V1 to V3, especially when the terminal T wave is positive, or ST segment elevation in V7, V8, V9. These are highly suggestive of posterior 
myocardial infarction or left circumflex coronary occlusion. The other equivalent is ST segment elevation in V3R and V4R, and this is highly suggestive of right ventricular infarction or ongoing ischemia. ST segment elevation in AVR and or V1, when it's coupled with ST segment depression more than or equal one millimeter in more than or equal six surface leads, is highly suggestive of multivessel ischemia or left main coronary disease, particularly if the patient presents with hemodynamic compromise. Okay, you have also mentioned something about bundle branch block. How does that bundle block affect the ST segment? In patients with high clinical suspicion of myocardial ischemia, the presence of left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block, or paste rhythm can preclude an accurate assessment of ST elevation. Therefore, in these patients with these ECG patterns, if they have signs or symptoms that are highly suspicious of ongoing myocardial ischemia, they should be managed similarly to those with clear ST segment elevation, regardless of whether the bundle branch block is previously known or not. Okay, we understood the importance of ST segment elevation, the diagnostic cutoffs, and the ST elevation equivalents. Now, what if we don't have ST segment elevation? If there's no ST segment elevation or no ST segment elevation equivalents, then the other working diagnosis in the presence of acute chest pain would be non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. And patients in this category who will have a rise and fall of cardiac troponin will fulfill the criteria of myocardial infarction, and they will receive the final diagnosis of non-ST elevation MI. In other patients who do not have troponin elevation, they will receive a final diagnosis of unstable angina. These patients may have a variety of ECG changes, including ST depression, transient ST segment elevation, T-wave abnormalities like hyperacute T-wave, T-wave inversion, biphasic T-waves, pseudo-normalization of T-waves, prominent negative T-waves. Alternatively, the ECG may be completely normal. We have elaborated more on ST segment elevation. Anything to mention about ST segment depression? ST segment depression is not only a qualitative sign, but it's also a quantitative marker of risk. The number of leads that show the ST segment depression and the magnitude of ST segment depression are both indicative of the extent of ischemia and they correlate with the prognosis. Then whenever we see ST depression, we'd better measure the magnitude of the depression in millimeters and also count the leads that show the depression. But what about T waves? Regarding the T waves, the prognostic value of T-wave inversion is definitely less than the ST-segment depression. But T-wave inversion can be an independent predictor of adverse outcome when it's observed in more than five or six leads. Other ECG abnormalities that are highly suggestive of severe coronary disease include Wellen sign and the winter sign. What are the winter sign and the Wellen sign? The winter sign is one to three millimeters of upsloping ST depression at the J point in leads V1 to V6 that continue into tall, positive, and symmetrical T waves. And this sign is highly suggestive of proximal LED occlusion. The other suggestive sign is the Wellen sign, which is minimal elevation of the J points with biphasic T waves in V2 and V3 or deep symmetric T wave inversion in V2 and V3 and can be seen up to lead V6. This is also highly suggestive of proximal LED occlusion. Thank you, doctor. We have learned today the spectrum of acute coronary syndromes, the difference between myocardial injury and myocardial infarction, the basics of history taking, physical examination, and more importantly, the ECG findings in a CS. I hope that we can continue this series on acute coronary syndromes, and I really wish that next time we dedicate more time for troponin. Yes, definitely you got that. Next episode will be dedicated for troponin to clear the confusion about troponin elevation, rise and decline and the different protocols of troponin in the emergency department. If you like the content, please hit the like button and subscribe and share the content with your colleagues and your friends to spread the knowledge. And see you next week.